I mentioned in a couple of sermons here recently about how it's very easy for people to think that once we're baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, that everything just sort of stays moving along very well, and we pretty well reached all we need to reach. Well, I think actually anybody that's been a member of the church for any length of time factually knows that's just not the case. We've heard too much emphasized about rising from the watery grave of baptism to be a new creature. And we've heard much about that being a new birth. And that our sins of the past have all been washed away in the blood of the Lamb when we were baptized for the remission of our sins. Yet at the same time, it seems to be um, that we can let ourselves slip, maybe is the way to put it, into thinking that, well, there's not a lot yet to do. And I think that's just not something that is um, going to help us at all in the long run. If you look at Israel of old, one of their big problems and one of the reasons they did not enter the land of promise was because of their murmuring. And it's very interesting that when you see spiritual Israel begin in Acts chapter 2, that it's not very long into the book of Acts, the book of conversions, that you have murmuring start in the Lord's church. We need to remember that in that fervent prayer for his disciples that Jesus prayed that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou didst send me, or hast sent me, John 17, 21. And sometime later, when Paul wrote to the church at Corinth to deal with a myriad of problems among them, he says, now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10. We might do ourselves very well to say, do I really believe that? Do I believe that when Christ prayed that actually there can be the answer to that prayer? And do I believe that men will obey 1 Corinthians 1.10? Because the church was very young at the time Paul wrote this. The New Testament's not fully revealed and written down. God desires such oneness or unity always among his people. But it's not always evident. If you look in the early chapters of Acts, you'll see that the church literally mushroomed from the beginning in Acts 2. From 3,000 on the first day to 5,000 men alone, then a multitude of priests, and the number was multiplied and, and multiplied greatly, Acts 2, 41, 47, chapter 5, 14, and chapter 6, 1 through 7. I don't know what we would do if we were living in a situation to where you had that kind of obedience to the gospel. Do you think that many people coming in could cause some possible problems? in things being done decently and in order, if not other reasons. It's said that the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and soul, chapter 4, verse, four, verse 32. That's a single-mindedness, and it will always assure wonderful results. So I can't hardly conceive of the church moving along this way. And remember, these things are said before there was one word of the New Testament written down. But the perfect agreement, as I said in the beginning, didn't long continue, even with the apostles present, under the eye of inspiration, if you please. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring, Acts 6 and verse 1. I almost want to say, yep, they're my brethren. Here's the first discord in the church of the living God. One thing you'll notice, of course it's recorded for us to learn from, isn't it? But you'll also notice it wasn't treated lightly nor neglected. 
it was a very serious breach of unity among the brethren. And it didn't involve in so far as I can determine, maybe you have in your study determined otherwise, but I don't think so. It didn't involve somebody teaching a false doctrine. It didn't involve anybody at this point practicing immorality. But they knew there was a problem among the people of God. And they didn't excuse it with, well, there will always be some that oppose any program we start out with. Well, that may be so, but what does that mean when we say that? Do we just let it go? No, they recognized the gravity of the sin and murmuring. After all, they were very familiar with the Old Testament. They knew exactly why that the people of God were treated as they were in the wilderness wandering and why they were there for 40 years in the first place. Not only did it involve various other sins, but it certainly involved the sin of murmuring, and they were murmuring against God. Why had God brought them out in the wilderness to die, etc., etc.? Let's go back to Egypt. I sure forgot about their persecution of Egypt as slaves. But the church knew they had to correct this situation. And you know, you can know what ought to be done all day long, but somebody has to do it. You can know you ought to obey the gospel. You can know what the Bible says. You can tell somebody else what the Bible says one must do to be saved. That won't do you any good if you don't yourself individually, personally obey it yourself. Somebody must act. Notice what is said to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 10. Neither murmur ye... And some of them murmured and were blessed and sent to heaven because of their murmuring and were destroyed of the destroyer. Is that in your Bible? Of course it is. Does it teach you a lesson? Sure does. The children of Israel died like flies, if you please, because of murmuring. Complaining. So we dare not try to minimize the gravity of such a situation. And the people there didn't in the early church. When it goes on unchecked in any congregation, you're watching the death throes of a congregation. You ever watch anybody die? Not a pleasant sight. Because that person wants to live, even unconscious. They'll be gasping and struggling. Sometimes people describe someone who's been mortally wounded as in his death throes. I happened upon a car accident one time. I was going out with a veterinarian to make a call to something. I don't know what it was, but... There had been a couple of boys, I think it was about three of them, in a pickup truck. And they were doing all right. They weren't doing anything wrong. But they were in where the road was doing this. And there was a husband and wife coming toward them. And they were having a fight between themselves. And as he was yang yang back at her and looking at her, he pulled over on the wrong side of the road. And they crashed headlong head on collision to the boys. Later, visited the boys in the hospital. But that night, the veterinarian, we both got to the car, and I said, I know you're a veterinarian, but is there anything you can do? And the paramedic got there about that time. So he went with the man who was trying to swallow his tongue and tried to help them whatever he could. And I was staying there. And I went around the car and looked in and the woman had fallen over into the seat. She had on new blue jeans, but she had hit the front end or the dashboard so hard that those brand new blue jeans like rotten cloth had just split. And she lay there with the death rattle in her throat. And after a while, it was all over here on this earth for her. Am I telling you just a deathbed story? Well, no. That happens every day all over this country. One way or the other. But we're talking about the spiritual body of Christ of which we are members in particular. The headship of Christ is exercised in each one of us through our belief and obedience to the truth. 
and understanding what the truth is regarding the work, the organization, and worship of the church. When the shepherds of the flock ignore complaints and murmuring and sin, they'll soon have no respect or honor from the church. And too often when murmuring is heard, shall we say weakened little men will agitate the situation rather than try to make a prayerful effort to correct the matter. Whatever is going on, I'm not even thinking of any particular matter whereby people murmur. You know, this doesn't take a whole lot for people to murmur and complain. Husbands toward wives, wives toward husbands. Are mothers wringing their hands about their teenage children? I don't know what in the world I'm going to do with them. I'm complaining, all of that. Notice the first step taken by the apostles when this murmuring in the Lord's church started. And remember, the murmuring is done by members. It's kind of interesting, murmuring members, members who murmur. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them, Acts 6 and verse 2. So the membership's never too numerous for elders to take them in confidence. You say, but this is apostles, this is not elders. Well, of course not. No indication there were elders at this time anymore. There was a written down New Testament. What have you got as the New Testament? Inspiration in men. What men? Did you hear the sermon this morning? The men who were baptized on the day of Pentecost with the Holy Spirit. There was a time when the New Testament walked around in the apostles. So they're not appealing to elders who are set up at this stage in the church, in the organization. You might say they're going to the Bible, you see. Because the church continues steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, Acts 2.42. So they're going to deal with the matter. Now remember at this time that the congregation numbered in Jerusalem 5,000 men. That doesn't mention women and children. So it's a pretty good sized place. So if thousands of members could be called together, and that's what the book says, then why can't a membership of 25, 50, 100, 200, or 300 be called together? I have to ask the question if they were called together, would they come? And if they didn't come, that'd say a whole lot about them. Those disciples of Christ didn't intend that anything should be done secretly in so far as what pertained to the whole church. And this matter involved the church, so the apostles called the church together. And in this given problem, the matter of murmuring, it was put squarely up to the whole church by the apostles. And specifically, those in the church who were doing the murmuring. Now notice, we're not saying that they didn't murmur over something they had a right to murmur over. Because these Jews who were Christians were Jews who were Hellenist Jews. That is, they were Jews born outside of Judea, Jerusalem, and Galilee. They had come there to observe feast days. While there, the church was established, they heard and believed and obeyed the gospel. And they're there. And the widows who were of these people were being neglected in the daily ministration because all the church had gathered up food, whatever else they needed, and they distributed it. And the murmurings coming from these outside Jews who are Christians against the Jews who are hometown Jews. And if you'll notice, it's from among the Grecian or the Hellenist Jews the very ones who were doing the murmuring, that the people are chosen. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out from among you seven men of honest report. There's one qualification. Full of the Holy Ghost. There's a third. And wisdom, fourth, or rather third. First, second, and third. Whom you may appoint over this business. Acts 6 and verse 2. The apostles gave them the qualifications. The people who had the problem were told to pick seven men according to the qualifications to deal with this particular matter. They said, we cannot personally 
be drawn away from what we as apostles can do. And only are the ones to do it. Everybody could do what apostle could do. The Lord didn't call but a few to be apostles. But others could do what was necessary to alleviate that problem in the early church. So how was the murmuring ended? And again, notice the Bible doesn't say the Grecian widows had a right or there was validity to their griping. Griping's my word, it's not in the Bible. <laughs> to their murmuring. This direct action proposed by the apostles for the church did have immediate results. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. Acts 6, 5. You know, I've been preaching 50-something years and rarely have I seen a decision please the whole multitude and they weren't anywhere near this big in multitude. But that put an end to the murmuring and complaining. They alleviated the problem by the apostles' direction while the apostles continued to preach the word which they could do by the power of the Holy Spirit but others could do these things. Which shows you again the principle of doing things decently and in order. And getting right to the root of the problem. Once these Grecian Jews who were Christians had chosen from among themselves according to the qualifications the apostles gave them, then the ones who had the problem were told to solve it. There's some wisdom in that, brethren. In case you missed it, that's not in the Bible. Just take up space. It actually teaches us something about how to settle a lot of problems. Everybody was pleased. And you know one of the big reasons I'm sure of that, the best I can get from the Scriptures, everybody was involved. I'd like to see that sometime in the church. You know, one will not complain at his own acts and decisions. You ever notice that? We complained about other people's decisions and actions. <laughs> Do you ever criticize yourself like you criticize other people? Now, there are some husbands that would like to, but they're too scared of their wives. They can't afford to, and sometimes vice versa. This was now their, underscore that, their program of work. They had the responsibility to solve the problem. They are going to take care of their own. They're going to make sure the widows that they thought at least were being neglected were going to be taken care of. And whether it's choosing men to serve as elders or deacons or whoever the preacher might be, or as to spending the church funds, then everything must be done decently and in order. People must be involved. People must know. People must be informed. Paul mentioned such who were chosen of the churches to travel, he says, with us with this grace, meaning collection. Avoiding this that no man should blame us. Providing for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also on the sight of men. 2 Corinthians 8, 19 through 21. Now, as anyone who knows what Paul was like in his honest living as a Christian, you think he's going to steal any money? You think he's going to take what doesn't belong to him? But Paul made sure he took people that the churches knew from the very churches themselves along with him. So there could be witnesses and testimony. The things were all handled on the up and up and done in the right way. You see that in Peter when they're still following the law of Moses and they don't understand that the gospel is for the uncircumcised Gentile. And when he goes then to the household of Cornelius, he realizes there's a big change coming on here from what has taken place. And he took witnesses with him. He knew he'd be called in question back in Jerusalem, which you've read Acts 11. You'll see that he was. And they jumped him, as we might say today, uh, you ate with Gentiles. But he had six men with him that witnessed everything that happened at the household of Cornelius. All of that you can see brought out in Acts 15 after the Judaizing teachers had arisen and they had that conference to find out where the problem coming from. 
Where is this doctrine coming from that says the Gentiles must be circumcised, keep the law, and be faithful to God and the church? So just read Acts 15, you'll see how they operated. What caused the murmuring to arise? Let me ask you a question. When do you murmur? Now, don't tell me you don't. You do. Don't compound your sin by lying about it. You murmur. Now, do you murmur against God? Oh, no, I don't murmur against God Almighty or Jesus Christ or the Holy Spirit or the Bible. Do you murmur against the things of God? Do you murmur about whoever is involved in doing what God said, doing the way God said, do it for the reason God said, do it in the organization of the church? You know, some of my brethren ought to be pretty plump and fat because of the preacher and elders and others that they have for dinner pretty often. Or wherever it is, they can get together and murmur and encourage one another in that kind of overeating. Let me ask you something. What would you do if your children murmured against your decisions like you murmur against other people's decisions? Well, that's just natural. We love them anyway, and they love us. Some things we don't think through, or it doesn't seem to me that we do. In settling the matter, nothing was said about the inefficiency on the part of those who had served. There was no hearing, there was no indictment, there was no trial. Now, the Greeks would have been in the minority as far as the hometown Jews who were members of the church were concerned. But again, let me emphasize to make a point or further emphasize the point I made earlier. Have you ever noticed the names of those seven men that were chosen? You ever noticed their names? Every one of them were Greek names. They're not names coming from the Jews of Jerusalem, Judea, and Gal Galilee. This is the way they quelled that particular murmuring. When any segment of the church murmurs and complains, you know what they're saying? Put me to work. Now, if they won't work, now we found out something. Now we find out it won't make a difference what we do or say. They're going to murmur. It also points out where the problem is. The apostles asked them to look out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. Well, when you think about it, anybody that's a mature Christian should be somebody like this that the elders can say, we want you to carry this out. And these three qualifications mean that they're trustworthy. You can trust them to carry out whatever it is you want to be done. And they're going to see that it's done. And done like it's supposed to be done. If you ever build a house, and some of you have, some of you are builders, others of us have been around it. Have you ever seen one, someone build a house who didn't have certain things done like they wanted it done? <laughs> may not suit you, but it suits them. Do you have a right if you're paying for the house? To have it built like you want it. Now look at the Lord who purchased the church with his blood and who built his church. Doesn't he have a right to have the church like he wants it? As to terms of entrance. As to its organization. As to its work. As to its worship. As to its discipline. Well, if he doesn't, tell me why this stuff's in the Bible. And when you read it, what does it do for you? After all, you know it'll be open on the day of judgment. People have to be spiritual, and we're learning what that means here when you see when the apostles said if they have these three qualifications, they're trustworthy. We can put it into their hands and it'll be done. As we have 
said it would be done. And they also were trustworthy enough to know that in matters of expediency and of options, they're going to choose what's best to get this job done quickly, best way possible, to alleviate the problem. How can we overcome whatever murmuring is done? By the way, it doesn't have to be the church. There's a heap of homes that are full of murmuring. I said earlier about husbands murmuring against their wives and wives against their husbands. Just go read your Bible and see how much that take, took place and is recorded in the Bible. Murmuring among the people. There's a heap of husbands that if they had the courage to say, I wish I had never married her. And the same thing's true of wives. I wish I'd never married him. Now in our day and time, the people who have no loyalty to God, Christ, Bible, or the New Testament, and especially its authority, they just walk off. No fault divorce. Just walk away. Nothing to get a divorce. Well, it's even gotten worse. People are living together like they were married when they're not. And they're free to go do as they please, and they will. And on and on it goes. But that doesn't change what the Bible says. It doesn't change what marriage is in the Bible, who's authorized to marry, the obligations of men, husbands, and fathers, and women, wives, and mothers. It doesn't change at all. And on the day of judgment, they will give an account for that as they march off into the eternal perdition. Well, the same thing's true of the church. When I'm baptized into Christ at the point of repentance, I resolved at that point forward that everything in my life is going to be changed. I'm going to give up anything that I was doing that's contrary to the will of Jesus, and I'm going to saddle myself with everything I need to do to be faithful to Him. And when I rise to that watery grave of baptism, I'm going to walk the straight and narrow way, no matter what it costs me, whether it's my friends or my family, or whatever, that's what I'm going to do. I've got a soul, and you do too, that's worth more than all material creation. And my Lord died on the cross of Calvary for me. Suffered agony beyond my mind of grass just for me. And he didn't do that and then say, well, what you don't like, you don't have to do. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. But you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. There's nothing in the picture we've been looking at that shows a disgruntled, factious spirit on the part of those who had waited on those tables when the murmuring arose. It's not there. Seemingly, they made a graceful exit to allow the seven chosen to take over the work. There's no indictment placed against them, no stigma associated with their leaving. You know, no person can please all or fit into all given circumstances. Uh, a preacher may find murmuring arising from congregation because he preached the truth all you got to do is ask yourself the question why was Jesus nailed to the cross and who did it and anybody that's going to be a preacher had better learn that any man that's going to be a shepherd over the flock had better learn that I am quite persuaded that the more I live like Jesus the more trouble I'm going to get into Jesus was sinless he was perfect. Those that had 1,500 years of the law given to them to bring them to him nailed him to a cross. Why do I think I can expect any different? What causes me to say, obey the gospel and it'll just be hunky dorily the rest of your life? Get married. There'll never be a problem. There'll never be a problem to settle. 
and then you see you you look forward to that first baby and you just rejoice and the next thing you know toward the end of the pregnancy they do test and he's going to be severely crippled the rest of his life and there's nothing anybody can do about it oh if you listen to the current view around the country you sort of bored him and start over again well compound sin with sin but I'm not but all of a sudden they're saddled upon you something you really didn't expect you're going to rear a child now and have to do all necessary to take care for what it's not responsible for and it changes everything there is because you didn't expect that when that child was first conceived or you have a child everything's going fine you have another child everything's going fine first one gets to be about six or seven years old struck down by spinal meningitis it's gone nothing you can do about it you know when you think of those things it sure makes murmuring seem to be so beneath us and you look around right now at your own children or you look around at others children it doesn't make any difference other members of your family and their children and you think, well, when they grow up and they marry, we have grandchildren, they're all going to grow up. You know that's going to happen. Did you see on the news yesterday where the little three, four, five-year-old boy, they don't know how old, washed up on the shore in Galveston? They were still trying to figure out who he was. There had been no reports made. Does that bother you? It wasn't my child. It was somebody's child. But that's somebody else. Let's bring it home to the Spring Church of Christ and each one of us members in particular and ask ourselves the question, am I contributing to the spiritual growth of the church? Am I encouraging the brethren? Do people look upon me as someone who encourages them in doing what is right? Have you ever, and I'll stop with this one, have you ever hunted? Have you ever hunted with a dog? I won't ask for hands. But when I grew up in Arkansas, we squirrel hunted and we coon hunted. And there were some dogs that were great. They, they would find that squirrel and they'd tree it. And you'd go up there and look and you'd see it. Boom! And when that gun popped, you know where the dog went. He was gun shy. Nobody wants a dog like that. I don't care how good he is at finding squirrels and three in them. Same thing true of a coon dog or any other kind of hunting dog. Some of us, if we don't watch out, are sort of like that gun shy dog. We start doing something and it's worthwhile. And we trail up the squirrel and we get him to the tree and he's up there and we sit down and we tree it. We've done a good thing if you're looking to <laughs> hunt squirrels. <laughs> that gun pops and we duck because we've been around so long. You know if you do a good thing in the church, there's somebody going to shoot at you. <laughs> or you think they are. Tell me one good thing. I'm talking about that which is authorized by the New Testament and is supposed to be done by Christians to be faithful. Tell me any of them that can be done by you or by any other member of the church worldwide that will not be criticized. That's like saying, preach on something that's not controversial. Well, if I preach on the existence of God, do you think that's controversial? If I preach on the deity of Christ, does anybody possibly think that's controversial? If I preach on the plenary verbal inspiration of the Bible, you think that could be controversial? If I speak on the church, is that controversial? If I show the errors of denominationalism, is that controversial? If I teach the steps and the plan of salvation, that's controversial. It's almost uh, funny, <laughs> humorous. We're worked up at the Muslims right now. How they don't 
don't eat pork, they don't believe in Jesus Christ, and they don't follow the Bible. A Jew doesn't eat pork, doesn't believe in Jesus Christ, and doesn't follow the New Testament. Well, yeah, but he's not out here trying to kill me. Anybody ever remember the name of one of Israel's prime ministers, Menachem Begin? Now, that's, some of you older ones may remember him. He was in the days of Jimmy Carter, back at that time period. You know anything about his background? He was a terrorist. He blew up the Hotel David in the late 40s before the British gave up the protectorate and before they had the war with the Arabs to come into the nation of Israel today. They did that kind of stuff. Now, I know that the nation of Israel and Jews don't like many Arabs do as Muslims are out trying to do all the things the Muslims are doing. But doctrinally speaking, doctrinally speaking, what is the difference in them? And that's not anti-Semitic. I'm just telling you they don't believe Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And used to over in Europe, and if you still go to some places today and you find a Rabbi walking along and you say something about Jesus being the Son of God and the Messiah, you may get this. That's exactly how they feel about it. The point I'm making is we have a problem that zeroes in on one thing and we don't even notice the other. And both of them equally bad. And we get in the church and you know right there, that's the focus. Nobody's seeing anything at all but that bottle of water. And they don't even see the microphone. <laughs> and we don't ask ourselves, well, what would I do? We just know what I wouldn't do, and that's whatever the decision is, I wouldn't do it. I'm going to close here because murmuring is a problem. I could preach this a year from now, five years from now, and guess what? The outline I'm using is at least 40 years old. And I've preached at every church I've been in. I wonder why. Do you think there's a need for it? Do you think this sermon is worthwhile? Maybe it could have been preached better by some better speaker. I don't know. But do you think it's important? Do you think murmuring is a sin? Of course it is. And once we rise from the water to the grave of baptism, we must live like Christians. And we must follow the teachings of the Bible pertaining to proper conduct as Christians. The old golden rule would go a long, long way in solving all murmuring. Whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you, do ye even also unto them. That solved a lot of problems. Now the Lord never did say we wouldn't have problems. You got problems with yourself. When you decided to obey the gospel, you knew you had a problem with yourself. You knew you stood before God condemned, and if you died then, you'd split hell wide open. But you also knew the solution. The godly solution. The biblical solution. And you obeyed the precious gospel of Jesus Christ and became a Christian. With the resolve of heart from now on, you're going to live like the Bible says. Well, there'll be problems. Somewhere or the other, the devil's see to that. If you determine to be faithful, he's going to make sure you have problems. But the solution to every one of them is in the Bible. Are you teachable? Are you correctable? You'll never grow if you're not. If you're not a child of God, we've studied what to do to become a Christian, to believe the gospel, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Christ, be baptized for the remission of sins. If you're not living the Christian life, there's a need of repentance, confession of sins, and prayer to God for forgiveness. If you're subject then to the wonderful invitation of Jesus Christ, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.